Tonight on World Report. Now from producer Micah Garrett, Egypt at a crossroads. On October 9th, a peaceful Coptic Christian protest in downtown Cairo was met with extreme violence by the Egyptian military. At least 24 demonstrators were killed. The Christians are killed in here. We tried by all means to be in peace. We don't have weapons. We don't know what to do. We don't know what to do. It's killing us now. The euphoria that swept across Egypt when mass demonstrations ousted President Hosni Mubarak in February is now over. It took just 10 months to go from joyous tears to growing dread. The Egyptian revolution is at a crossroads. The army's attack on Coptic Christian protesters outside of Maspiro, the Egyptian state television building, is the most recent and deadly encounter in a string of increasingly violent confrontations between protesters and the Egyptian army. On the streets of Cairo, the sentiment is that not much has changed since Mubarak stepped down, and many believe the situation has only gotten worse. Although parliamentary elections are slated to begin at the end of November, Egypt is still under decades-old emergency law, and few trust that the Supreme Council for Armed Forces, known as SCAF, will give up power. We are coming to a point where everyone is realizing more and more that the SCAF is an extension of the Mubarak regime and that for the revolution to win, we have to completely remove them off power and we have to come to this confrontation and they are forcing this confrontation on us. Mona Saif, a cancer researcher at Cairo University, has been an activist in the revolution from the beginning. In March, she helped found the group No Military Trials for Civilians to bring attention to the trial of civilian protesters in military court. But now the use of military trials is, is escalated more and more against activists. So basically a march like the one we are in now, we could very easily be arrested and uh, military tried uh, for insulting the army. Since January 25th, the day Egypt's revolution began, more than 12,000 civilians have been arrested by the military and 8,000 convicted and sent to military prison with sentences ranging from 1 to 25 years. The detentions have become a rallying cry for the revolution, breathing new life into a movement that has stalled in the past few months. Anybody that was uh, protesting or demonstrating was in danger of being arrested and thrown in a military tribunal with almost no defense whatsoever. This says, Yaskut, this says, Yaskut Hukm al Askar, that means um, down with military rule. Shahira Abuela, who co-founded No Military Trials for Civilians with Mona Saif, has been fighting what she calls the injustices under the military rule in Egypt. People called us um, uh, traitors, that we were trying to drive a wedge between the army and the people. Um, and to them, the army was uh, an all-good doer. They, they got rid of Mubarak for us, so they were heroes. And, and anybody that criticized national heroes was not welcome in the public sphere. First, I want you to know that what's happening now isn't a revolution of Muslim people. Michael Nabil Sanad, an activist and blogger, gained notoriety as the first prisoner of conscience since the toppling of Mubarak. His case garnered international attention after he started a hunger strike in August to protest his imprisonment. There was a very famous chant that said, the, the people and the army are one hand. He was imprisoned for writing a blog that was entitled The Army and the People Were Never One Hand. And so he was literally imprisoned for insulting the army and he got a three-year um, sentence and um, he's on a hunger strike now. Michael Nabil's family has been campaigning tirelessly to win his freedom. Michael's brother, Mark, pleads with the military court by cell phone, urging them to release Michael or at least transfer him to a hospital for medical treatment after weeks on a hunger strike. Michael's father appeals to General Tantawi, apologizing on behalf of his son. When I went to the military court, I met with the head of the information center and with the head of the military court general. He took the appeal of forgiveness of Michael to the field marshal. 
And then I asked the general of the military court to transfer my son into a hospital as soon as possible because he had been on a hunger strike for 44 days. The military has threatened Michael's family, saying that both they and Michael will face retribution if they continue to talk to the media. But that threat has not stopped their efforts. Michael is only allowed a visit every 15 days. His health status was so bad on the 1st of October. He weighed 60 kilograms and it went down to 40. Due to his strike, he lost 22% of his weight and he can't move. He arrives on a wheelchair and he would barely greet us because he was so weak. His life might end now. His life is a big risk and he may die at any moment. Determined to keep media attention on his brother's case and pressure the military, Mark holds a press conference at a human rights organization in downtown Cairo. Is the main reason for Michael's case because he didn't serve in the army? There are only two charges, insulting the military institution and spreading false news about the military institution. I don't know the reasons why my dad wrote this statement of apology to SCAF, but me, personally, I have a different standpoint. I don't see that Michael has done anything wrong that we should apologize for. What is going to be the case if, God forbid, Michael dies in prison? We will sue the Supreme Council of Armed Forces because they are the ones imprisoning Michael. In the last message he wrote us on Saturday, he said, Tell the people outside I am still strong. They didn't break me. The army will never be able to affect me. Outside the military court on the outskirts of Cairo, where Michael's case is being heard, protesters gather to chant for Michael's freedom, as well as the freedom of other detainees. I totally reject the fact that they are detaining people randomly. The injustice is in detaining the political activists. Poor Michael, who's dying in prison. And they have no mercy on him. Filming the military court building isn't allowed. Demonstrators and journalists are detained at almost every protest for filming confrontations with soldiers at the gate. The day that I filmed, a cameraman and soundman from Cairo News Company were beaten and detained by the military at the entrance. I was lucky to escape arrest for filming there. Michael's lead lawyer is optimistic about his chances for release. The prosecutor haven't any legal evidence against Michael Nabil Sanat. And the hope that after all of this international and national support that they can hear our voices and let him go. After eight hours, Michael's brother Mark emerges from the hearing, greeted by the small group of journalists and supporters still waiting for him. Today, they canceled his three-year conviction. It was a false one, and he will be transferred to another court. Can I ask you if you feel like it's a victory today? The real victory is when Michael is released and won't be retried. The day ends in disappointment. Although the military agreed to retry Michael's case, he remains in detention and on hunger strike, leaving many to believe that the military's response was simply another stalling tactic meant to keep him in prison. Coming up, a torn country tries to move forward. Where's the revolution now? This is the question that all of us need to know the answer to. We don't know whether we made a revolution or not. But can Egypt still hope for a democracy? That's next. World Report continues. Once again, here's Egypt at a crossroads. Even though the number of demonstrators on the streets of Cairo are small, compared to the hundreds of thousands who came out in protest against the regime of President Hosni Mubarak earlier this year, the number of different groups demanding their rights is growing. A group of lawyers demonstrates against corruption and nepotism in the judicial system. We are protesting against uh, judges. The new law gives them the right to uh, put anybody in the jail. <laughs> Journalists from the journalism syndicate protest the army's recent efforts to censor the media. The military council said don't publish any news uh, about the higher military council 
without the permission of intelligence. But overall, the revolution is unable to garner the tremendous public support it had when it began. On Fridays, the traditional day for demonstrations, Tahrir Square, the gathering point for the revolution, remains largely empty. At an April 6 movement demonstration in support of unity between Christians and Muslims, many onlookers seem indifferent to the protest. The April 6 movement was founded as a Facebook group to support a workers' strike that took place on April 6 in 2008 and has since grown into one of the main revolutionary youth groups in Egypt. Some in the crowd are unhappy with their continued revolutionary activity. We respected uh, 6 April uh, before, but now they lose. They lose the support from the Egyptian public because they try to fight with, uh, with the Egyptian army. At one point, the scene becomes tense as a counter-revolutionary crowd taunts the activists, chanting a slogan used by those supporting the Egyptian military, the army and the people are one hand. At the Al-Azhar Mosque in Cairo, activists organize another demonstration against sectarianism, planning to march from the mosque to the Coptic Cathedral in Abbasaya to show solidarity between moderate Muslims and Christians. When prayers end, activists outside of the mosque begin to chant, Muslim and Christian are one hand. They are met with angry chants from counter-demonstrators. The army and the people are one hand, the crowd shouts. Some in the crowd start throwing rocks, driving the activists away from the mosque before the unity march can even begin. Many activists believe that the army is using sectarianism to divide Egypt, encouraging thugs and troublemakers to take to the streets to intimidate pro-democracy activists. But even in Tahrir Square, the heart of the democratic movement, sectarian divisions and religious tension are not hard to find. Adil Ahlo, who says he was imprisoned under Mubarak for 10 years, sees the revolution as an opportunity for a new caliphate to emerge, an Islamic state stretching from North Africa to Syria. I consider myself a godfather for this revolution. The civilian state is a state with no religious identity, and we do not accept this. His words generate an angry response from moderate Muslims and Christians listening to him speak. We are the revolutionaries. We are the spark. This revolution came from freedom, social justice, and a civilian state. A civilian state that consists of the revolutionaries, the people, and all the Egyptians. In a villa in the Sayeda Zainab district of Cairo, members of the April 6 movement meet to discuss the future of Egypt. They work late into the evening, training new members and discussing how to organize themselves as Egypt's elections approach at the end of November. Many in the movement are disillusioned by what has happened since Mubarak's fall. Where is the revolution now? This is the question that all of us need to know the answer to. We don't know whether we made a revolution or not. Despite their concerns, members of the April 6 movement are determined to play an active role in Egypt's future both as a social movement and in the political process. Tariq El Huli is running for parliament as a member of the Coalition of Revolutionary Youth. When we came down to the street, we thought that we had no chances in winning, but we figured out that people strongly support the youth. They think the youth have something new to offer. The word change is a magical word. But Tariq and others fear that the military leadership will control the outcome of the elections, much like the Mubarak regime used to. Today was the first day to apply for elections. None of us, the youth, were able to register. Today was definitely the day of the old regime. We went to have a look around and found out that all those who wanted to run for elections were from the old regime. Karim Rahim, from the organization No Military Trials for Civilians, believes that the outcome of the elections is already predetermined. There is a deal between the military and the Muslim Brotherhood. Al-Wada is going to form a new government. The Muslim Brotherhood is going to take over parliament, and SCAF is going to take the presidential elections. Echoing the sentiment of many activists, he worries that the outcome of the elections will lead to violence, and that the next stage of the revolution may look more like Libya, which erupted into a violent and bloody civil war. 
The chants are starting to become violent. They are no longer peaceful, peaceful, peaceful. Some people have started to say, a peaceful revolution is over. Whether the protesters remain peaceful, it is clear that the army has decided to use violence as a tool to suppress the opposition. Maspero, the state television building, is the epicenter for the Egyptian military's media control and has become a flashpoint for demonstrations. A week before the deadly clashes on October 9th, a Coptic Christian protest on October 5th at Maspero was brutally suppressed by the Egyptian army. A video of the army beating a protester went viral, sparking outrage. The incident inspired around 10,000 Coptic demonstrators to march again on Maspero on October 9th. We are Coptics of Egypt, we are Christians, we are protesters now, and we are uh, wanting our rights. We have no rights. We have no rights to, to build our churches. We have, we have no rights to pray. We have no rights to take jobs. It's a clear, frank question. Why you want to hand Egypt to fundamentalists? As the protesters rounded the Hilton Hotel onto the road that runs along the Nile, they were stopped by the army in front of Maspero, and the shooting began. Demonstrators ran for cover under the bridge as two army vehicles raced up and down the street. I could hear the shots getting louder as the armored personnel carriers approached and had to take cover under the bridge. And told everybody to, uh, to move on, move on, move on. Uh, people was on the ground and they uh, stepped on them. I stepped on a dead people on my, on my way coming. Can you remember the, the scenes where Tahrir Square with the, with the cars uh, moving over people? It's happening the same, but uh, with, the, with army uh, cars. Army soldiers burst into two television stations doing live broadcasts and forced them to shut down at gunpoint. The army then announced on state television, in their words, that the good people of Egypt should come out to the street to defend the army, a thinly veiled call to gangs and thugs who poured out onto the streets, attacking Coptic protesters and those supporting the revolution. The fighting continued well past midnight. People gathered the wounded and the dead and rushed them to the Coptic hospital. Some were shot, others had been run over by the army vehicles. The army shut down the streets from 2 a.m. to 7 a.m. to clean up all traces of the fighting that had taken place. In a press conference after the attack, the Supreme Council for Armed Forces denied that they were responsible for the deaths, claiming that it was some other group. The armed forces will never ever shoot at the Egyptian citizen, whatever the reasons are. Activists and human rights organizations held their own press conference to counter the military's claims. One of the protesters killed was the well-known activist, Mina Danielle, whose sister spoke about his life. I am Mina's sister, Mary Daniel, the one who raised him. I didn't have anything more beautiful than him in my life. He was the fruit of my life. If it was a country against another country, that would be fine. But it was Egyptian bullets. How long will Egypt drink its son's blood? The organizers showed video clips gathered from multiple sources, presenting graphic evidence of the violent attack from the army, which was consistent with what I witnessed. The video included soldiers hitting protesters with army vehicles and the bodies of children at the hospital who had been run over. The images are beginning to look strikingly similar to those during the worst days in January, when the revolution began and was at its most violent stage. But back then, protesters were battling police and thugs, while the military remained largely on the sidelines. The attack at Maspero on October 9th has galvanized pro-democracy activists to fight both sectarianism and military rule in Egypt. But the struggle is only getting harder. 
estates spreading lies, especially when it comes to sectarian issues. Mona Saif, who co-founded No Military Trials for Civilians, is now fighting to get her brother, Allah Abdel Fettah, released from military jail. Allah, a prominent activist and Egypt's first political blogger in 2006, was recently detained by the military on charges of inciting violence at Maspero. After being sent briefly to a mental hospital, Michael Nabil is back in prison. Still on a hunger strike after more than 75 days, it appears more and more likely that he may die in prison. At a recent protest for Muslim and Christian unity in Talat Harb Square, around 1,000 people gathered to light candles in memory of those killed at Maspiro. At least for the moment, the feeling is much like it was on January 25th, the first day of the revolution. But no one knows for sure what the outcome of the elections will be, and whether Egypt is headed for democratically elected civilian leadership, or a long dark period of military rule.